Today is Sunday 26th of February, time is 10 to 3 and I'm doing a video taped interview with Mary Logan as the interviewer and me being the interviewee. It's for the Folklore Project in UCC. It's on the Phoenix Martial Arts Club in Limerick and on the Wu Chi Club in UCC. Okay, Brian. What style of martial arts do you do, or did you practice, and how long did you practice it? Well, I do uh, Shaolin Wushu Kung Fu, which is Chan Chun Lung Fist. I do Ryu Kyu Kobudo, and I do Shindo Musuryu Jo. On top of that, I do Shaolin Mocho, which is a five ancestor system, which I learned with Kim Han. I'm only doing the basics of that. And also Wu Qi, which I trained privately with Kim Han to learn along with Chinese weapons. I also do Shihatsu physiotherapy. And I teach Zen as well as other forms of meditation for martial arts specifically. And are all those martial arts styles like karate? Or are they are they different? Do you use weapons? Well the uh Shaolin Wushu is Kung Fu, as people would know it, like which just means hard work, which should be a good description of a lot of the training some of the nights. Um, the Ryukyu Kobura would use weapons, uh, Nanchikubo and Sai. The Shindo Masuryu Jo would use a four foot staff as long as along with a, a wooden boken, it defends. The wooden staff is used to fight the actual attacker who's using a wooden boken. And the Chinese weapons, which Kim Han taught me, which there are five, which would be the Quan Dao, the Chinese broadsword, the Northern Staff, also Southern Staff, the Three Section Staff, and the Jian, which is a Chinese straight sword, it's a double sided blade. Okay, and you men mentioned Shihetsu, is that like Swedish massage or is it something different? It's a Japanese martial arts therapy which is used for physiotherapy and Namakashi. Takujiro Namakashi is the founder of it and um, he helped to make Shihetsu a worldwide name. I have an actual book of his which my teacher Mike Finn studied under him directly in Japan. It's, this is his book Japanese Finger Pressure Therapy Shihetsu by Takujiro Namakashi. It's a healing martial martial arts is about healing as well as injuring people. Okay. Um, what is the name of your club and where is it? The name is the Phoenix Martial Arts Amateur Martial Arts Club and it's also known as the Wu Chi Club in UCC. It's the Phoenix Club is down in Limerick. We have a a hall in Thomas Street, Halaida, it's the Gaelic League Hall. We teach there on Sundays between eleven and three. And we also teach there on Tuesday nights from 7.30 to 9. We've also, one of our students, Pat Fitzgerald, has an actual gym out in County Clare on 40 acres that he owns. He's converted an old farmhouse and beautiful looking thing. We've actually got the uh, Duke the Mats from the old gym in Broad Street in there. And this Halaida, do you rent that or do you own that? No, we rent it. We used to have our own gym in Broad Street before that we had it in Catron Street, but uh, we rent it now. We're, we were a full-time gym at one stage. And the one in Cork, do you rent that again? or? Well, it's just part of UCC, that's, that's all it is really. Okay. <coughs> uh, how, many how many years is your club established and who are its founders? Um, <coughs> I'm the founder of the, the club in Limerick. Um, uh, there's two other instructors there who help teach there and that's Mary Logan. She's in UCC with me at present. She also teaches the Wu Chi Club. She's the down for the head instructor in Wu Chi in Cork City. <coughs> and um, we've got Peter McNamara in Limerick who's got black belts in other styles. Along with Mary, Mary has a number of black belts in different styles. How many people are involved? Um, instructors, members, fighters, administration, things like that? There's actually four instructors. One of them is uh, Paul Matthews. He's in London. He's got a, he used to have a club over there, but due to work, he had to close it down, work pressure. Um, 
the other instructors I've already mentioned, and myself, basically were the people who run it. Right, and how many members <coughs> will be in the club in Cork and Limerick? On a busy night in UCC you can get 20 people on a Thursday night. Um, we also teach on a Monday on the pergola in UCC, which is a glass structure outdoors. And we teach in the hall again, in U the Maltings gym, on Friday afternoon. You, on those two days you get about ten in the pergola and you get about six or seven in the Maltings gym on the Friday afternoon. And how many would you have in Limerick on your students? Limerick on its most busiest time you'll have about 15, 16, maybe 20 sometimes. Are there any club memories that the club is especially proud of? Well, the club has been involved in an awful lot of things. Like, um, the history goes back further than Halaida, like I've been teaching for 20 years. I've been with martial arts for 20 years, and uh, you can go back with the club memories much further. We've done demonstrations of Kobodo, for instance, at kickboxing matches. Um, we've also done martial arts demonstrations inside in King John's Castle, I think that was two years ago, at um, a battle reenactment tournament that was going on there. Um, we've gone to England training with Mike Finn and Kim Hand, myself and Mary Logan have gone over in courses and they've gone over in private courses. Um, so there's a whole lot of memories there, just from training. But I suppose a lot of people these days, with the, the newer members, because UCC is linked to Limerick, you've got the St. Patrick's Day Parade would be a big one between them, and plus going up and down to, from Cork, going up to Limerick, doing courses up there, private courses up there for fun. Okay. Um, who are your heroes outside the club, and who would you most admire inside your clubs? Well, I suppose there's, there's a number of people I could admire inside my club to begin with. I mean, there's Peter McNamara, and there's his wife, Noreen. Noreen also trained with us. She's taking a break at the moment, but uh, they're two characters. Uh, Peter's as strong as an ox, and Noreen, she's about, I suppose she's about five foot tall. She's a, she's a slight build, but I've seen her terrorise beginning students <laughs> when they come in. She just jumps up and screams, and you see the beginner you will be falling down from it. And outside the club? Um, outside the club, I would, I could look at Mike Finn now or Kim Han. These are my Chinese instructors. Outside, for their skills. Basically, the, the people are they're just so exceptional. Mike Finn is just so fast. Are both of them Chinese? No, Mike Finn is English. Um, his grandfather was a bodyguard to, I think it was De Valera. But uh, at one stage, but he he went over to England, and he's took kind of his family is three generations of Metropolitan Police. Afterwards, um, he spent a number of years in Japan, and he's got forty black belts. He does uh, ten different martial arts. He holds four ten in each. Um, Kim comes from Malaysia. He's a uh, Chinese, and I can remember trying to punch at him one time, and he just wasn't there, <laughs> and I ended up on the ground. I'm fairly fast when I throw a punch. I can usually get a person when I throw it, especially since I was only about five feet away from him. But um, he's very, very strong. Uh, the both of them are very, very strong and very, very fit. They're, they're both about 50, over 50 years of age. And the, the level of fitness would put most martial artists to shame. And the actual technique and the, the ability with weapons is just unbelievable to watch. And is that why they have the status of being the most admired people in your mind? Yeah, it would be, yeah. What's your own personal greatest triumph to do with martial arts? Well, I have kind of a number of them now, I suppose, to an extent, rather than just one. Um, biggest triumph that you have is that the club is still going on. There's a lot of clubs fold. A lot of people come into martial arts. Um, you could get a thousand people, and only one of them will make the black belt. Um, from the black belt level you get people falling out after five or six years. There's a lot of personality clashes just like any other sport in it. But my, um, I suppose the biggest thing is that I'm still at it for me and that I'm still learning. I 
It's the one I would actually go for. And what would be your club's greatest triumph? The club's greatest triumph is that it still exists as well. Um, I mean, we spend our time teaching beginners. We teach them self-defence. It feels good, like when you see someone who comes in who feels who has no confidence, and you see them gr gaining confidence over time and improving, getting better and better, and they, they finally feel confident enough to actually just go and leave. You know. Do you have a lot of people who stay up to higher grade or black belts? Do you have any? Do you have many people with high grades and black belts in your club? Well, at the moment I've got <coughs> two people with black belts inside in the club in Limerick. Uh, Mary Logan is one. She has a black belt in self-defence and weaponry. Um, Peter McNamara has the, the same grade. Dave also got, Peter has black belt grade in Shaolin Kung Fu. And he's also got grades in Ryukyu Kobodo. He's got brown belt in that. Um, Mary has grades in Ryukyu Kobodo, brown belt, and also she's got, um, she's one step away from the black in Taekwondo. She had to give it up over her knees. But uh, they're the two highest. We've also got a younger lad, Ian, who's going for his black belt at the moment. And we've got a number of other people. There's quite a few who are of different grades. We've a number of blue belts, green belts. The grades go in order of yellow, red, green, blue, purple, brown, brown, and then black. But we have a number with one or two purple belts, a um, number of blue belts, about four, f six, seven blue belts. Um, we have about six yellow belts and about five red belts. Okay. What was your greatest disappointment? Well, I could put it as two. I, I've got two disappointments. One is I had a friend of mine, Cyril Peters, who used to train with me. And um, Cyril was going for... He was going to be coming back training with me when I returned to Limerick, but uh, Cyril died, so we never got the chance to continue the training in that sense. The other one that would have been a disappointment for me would have been that we had a gym in Broad Street. The club has been taken away for the last 15 years. I was with uh, PJ Bennis, one of the instructors that I trained under in Kung Fu in Limerick, and they had a large amount of respect for But we've now gone our separate ways. He's gone off to another club, but we actually had a gym together. And I thought that the actual gym would have taken off and we could have got a bigger place. But he wanted to go to train with another instructor somewhere else. Okay, and what would the club's greatest disappointment be? Would it be tied in with that, or are there any other things? Well, I put it that it was tied in with that. Like we lost an awful lot of. I mean, it was a fully matted hall. It was about thirty feet. It was about eighteen feet wide by about thirty-five feet long, with a changing room after that. It was fully matted. We had punch pads on the walls. We had speed balls. We had pictures up there. It was open seven days a week. So the training standard was very high, exceptional standard of the students that were there at the time. So I would put that that was the biggest one as far as I'm concerned. Okay. Um, does the club have any sayings or jokes or anything like that associated with it? Uh, there's a couple like, um, we have blood for the blood god when we do uh, the padded work. We're training with padded weapons as a kind of a battle charge. And uh, don't die for your country, make the other guy die for his. And there's a dozens of others that, that go on. Each of the, the lads comes up with his own saying for it. Um, I suppose a real saying is that if you get into trouble, turn it away and run. Avoid trouble at all costs is the philosophy that we're giving out. And the other one is that we're actually, you can improve with just a little bit of practice if you keep trying. Uh, do you have any memorable memorable stories about the club or about one of its more colourful members? Members. Well, we'd <coughs> I can remember um, we had one of the students from Kirk come down. He was he was actually an Aikido practitioner, Sean. And Sean came down and he uh, was doing all these fabulous throws with students. He'd given a course inside that hall that I mentioned in Broad Street, 
and he was doing all these fabulous throws and he came up against um, an old and Joe now Sean would be about my height he'd be about 12 stone so he'd be lighter than me but he was very good with his technique but when it came to Joe and Noel he couldn't move them it was like trying to move a man mount them and he kept falling rather than him knocking them he kept getting knocked down uh, Joe's about 17 16 17 stone 15 no he's about 16 stone uh, he's just solid muscle his actual upper arm is the same size as my tie um, Noel is bigger again he's about 20 stone 18 to 20 stone and his upper arm is the same measurement as my tie I've actually got a measuring tape in the past and measured them <laughs> because I've tried techniques and they haven't worked on these people they're so big but uh, they're, they're, they would be one another one I remember the girls trying to take uh, down Noel one night in the muggy and he just picked them up like flowers and put them off to the side without actually doing any damage to them <laughs> but uh, they didn't stop that they jumped up on him again and they, they knocked him down they got his t-shirt off of him and they kept it as a trophy in the ladies changing room. <laughs> okay. um, what martial arts sayings, words of wisdom or philosophy do you give your students to encourage them? There's, um, there's, a, there's a, there'd be a number of sayings like, like I mentioned with the, the one previous it's a similar question. Um, one of the ones I've always liked is when the hand goes forth, withhold the anger. When the anger goes forth, withhold the hand. It's out of Richard Kim's book, Weaponless Warriors from Okinawan Karate. So is your club influenced by Eastern philosophies or religions then, like um, Buddhism or Taoism? It would be influenced by the philosophies of them, like um, the Taoist thing about using, like you've got yin and yang, and using your opponent's strength or overcoming them with strength if they're weak, or, or, using their strength in a way. It's softness, you see it in Tai Chi, you see that kind of, the big guy getting pushed around by this small old Chinese master. Um, Kim Han used to do it to me and I've seen him do it to a number of other people. Mike Finn would do the same thing. Um, physically, he showed. We have, I suppose the, there's the influence of Zen that you must keep practicing, keep focusing your mind and actually trying to improve yourself step by step, a personal spiritual journey through martial arts and you've also got the Buddhist idea that the idea of not harming anyone is actually one of the, the fundamentals in Buddhism. You were speaking about Chihatsu earlier on is healing directly connected to martial arts or is that just something separate you took up? It's always been there. Um, Mike Finn used to tell a lovely story about in London that uh, when he was in Japan he heard uh, some Japanese masters talk about a school at the turn of the century where there was muggings going on in the local area and they had no organised police force in that area so they went up to the local martial arts schools and they would sort out the problems. Um, so a couple of the, one old guy from the club was holding, he used to walk down the streets at night time waiting to be mugged with two chickens under his arms and uh, out come the muggers, they attacked them. He squeezed the chickens, the chickens jumped forward and scratched the two attackers' face. A number of attackers surrounded him and with that he whistled and a dozen of the martial artists came from the edges and in the darkness they beat up the attackers. They were training in the dojo the next day when along came the attackers all broken up, bruised and um, <laughs> with dislocated joints. And the, the teachers came along and pretended that they didn't know who the attackers were. It was kind of an agreement between the both groups. And they reset the joints and did their healing because if they had actually gone to a local doctor, they would have been reported and they could have ended up in jail. But the, it shows you that the, the medicine part of it is there. And Chinese medicine has been linked with it back for maybe two, three thousand years. Mm -hmm. Acupuncture and acupressure, such like. Now, is your club open to all ages? And if it is, what ages are your youngest members and what ages would your oldest members be? Youngest members would be from about six to seven. There's a couple of boys and girls there at the moment that age. Um, the oldest members um, we've had would be about 65 in the 65 age bracket. There would have been... There was a number of people last year in the club that were actually around that age bracket. There was two of them in there, and they were between 60, were in their 60s. 
fifties and sixties, yeah, that was it. The Richard Commons in London would probably be my oldest, he was sixty five. And does the age of the practitioner limit what they can practice at? Or the time they they put into practicing it? Well obviously no, he's not gonna be able to do a uh, man or woman is not going to be able to kick not to the head at sixty five unless they've been doing stretching all their lives. But um no, not really. They they come with a a sense of control that they're, they're looking for to learn how to improve their health and possibly defend themselves. Um, it doesn't seem to stop them. Obviously, the, their kicks are a little bit lower and their punches are a little bit slower. But a lot of um, all the people have a fierce power when they punch or kick. When they do hit you, you you do know it. So, so I don't see any problem with it. So it doesn't matter what age the person is, they can train up until any age if they're able to, oh if yeah. they want to. And I mean the smaller children, like I said earlier, I had to um, learn to use techniques, locks and holes, and Noel was a huge man. And by me being able to do, to practice my locks and Noel and Joe, I found out what worked for a smaller person. So I was able to teach the children that were smaller than me again, how to use the techniques against me and use them as a method of self-defense. Is your style open to both men and women? I know you have one female instructor, but do you oh, have well, we have a training? number of ladies inside the class. There's Noreen, she's not our instructor, like I said, but she's taking a break at the moment. And also we have uh, Vivian. There's a number of small, smaller girls there. And over the years, we've had a number of women training with us. It seems to be increasing. I think movies like Xena, or series like Xena, and, um, I suppose Buffy the Vampire Slayer is letting girls break out of the traditional roles for the sit at home. And does being female ability their limit uh, limit their ability to practice? As in, martial arts seems to have a lot of aggression involved, which is traditionally a male thing. I don't know. I don't know. The women I know are quite aggressive anyway, like so. I don't think I'd have a problem with it. Um, but uh, no, I don't think so. Um, this. The girls themselves, they are able to do, they look a lot more graceful when they do things like forms or katas, which are set moves or routines with maybe 20 or 30 moves, with punching maybe and kicking involved in it. Um, they look a lot more graceful. They, they've got a lot of better, better technique. They've got stronger hips, so once they're trained to use it, they can actually do better kicking and punching. They're usually more flexible, not always, and they do have a more flexible spine than the male. So. I think that it, it's just each of us has different abilities. The men is a bit stronger physically, but a, a woman the same height as a man, the, the strength balances out, I think. Right. Um, you were speaking about Mike Finn and Kim Han. Um, their qualifications, are they above other people's and did any of them spend time in other countries training and learning specific arts? Um, well, Mike Fenn spent a number of years in Japan, like I said, he's also been abroad to America. Um, he trained with all the masters in Japan at that time period, which is the early 70s, so he has a number of, he's got video footage of the actual times he was out there. He had a cine camera, he's transferred it onto video now, with hours of training with different masters, like people from Shindo Masaryo Joe and Kobodo, he has the and Eido Japanese swordsmanship, he'd have all that on tape. So he he's been out there. He trained with Dan F. Drago, who himself was exceptional. He wrote many books and many brilliant books on martial arts and opened the doors for Westerners out there. Kim Han has trained under three Shaolin monks, so he's teacher um Chikim Tong which is in, I did believe the headquarters is Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. He's exceptional. I've seen the, seen Chicken Tongue in Ireland, and I've seen this small Chinese man throw people 15, 20 feet using techniques, and he's about 75, 80. Um, do you consider your style sports or self-defense orientated? Well, I consider it more self-defense orientated, and um, 
with the weapons training, uh, I suppose like a moving Zen, you're learning to improve yourself and strengthen your body, so it's physical fitness. Also, we do have our sporting side, we're getting more into it now with punching and kicking, um, sparring inside the club. It's just you can't do everything in a, a short time space, slowly we're building up again from the Broad Street disaster. Do you believe your stance can be better than others, and why if you do? I don't think it's better than others, I just, just think that it's one that suits me. Um, martial arts in general, it depends on the guy and the, the night if you're fighting someone. Um, a kickboxer can be beaten by a boxer, it just depends on your skill. A boxer can be beat by a street fighter, a judo guy could beat the street fighter. It, it just depends on who you're up against. They're, they're just If you're good, you're good is the simplest way of putting it. Um, you said you used weapons in your in your some of your systems. Why? I mean, surely you can't walk around with these things in the streets and hit people with them. Well, the weapons, like I said, you're building control. It looks nice. Um, you've got, you've got the actual set routines where I'd attack someone with a staff, hitting down their head. They'll block. Uh, they'll come back at me with another attack. Uh, I'll come at them with another two attacks or something. And It'll continue like that for maybe 20 or 30 moves, maybe more even, between both sides, at high speed. So you have to have your concentration. If you make a mistake, there can be accidents. You're learning to watch a person, to watch for anything at all, any point where they could be attacking you from. So you're trying to improve yourself all the time. As for picking up weapons, anything can be a weapon in the street. Um, usually I would tell people to avoid using a weapon in the street and get away, but if someone's attacking you with another weapon, the best defence is a weapon. If you're a beginner and someone, a black belt, attacks you, the best defence you're going to have against him is a weapon. You mentioned there that there could be accidents. Have there ever been serious accidents in the clubs? Accidents? Well, Mary Logan split my eye off him with a staff one time. But that was more my own fault. They'd come up from uh, Cork, which is a three-hour bus journey, um, before I got the car. And we were training from 7 o'clock until 11 that night, and about somewhere about half 10. I was trying to get faster and faster at my techniques during the weapons training. And I was too slow with a block, and she came in. I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. I got a cut across the eye, the top of the eye. I got about three stitches. Um, but no, that's that's about the most. Uh, that's you will get cracked joints if you if you're going to play with wooden weapons. You know I mean, play. You shouldn't actually spar with them. But if you play with wooden weapons, like I've caught one or two of the students picking up the staff fighting, um, you're obviously going to get injured. And they learn very quickly to move off to the padded weapons. And if they do use a, a staff, we use the the ice hockey gloves, which I showed earlier on in the tape, to actually protect your fingers okay. and body armour to protect your chest. Um, some people think that martial artists are dangerous and that they're violent and that martial arts should be banned. What would you say to that? I'd say they're talking through their hat, actually, is, is what I would say. Um, the reason being, you get you don't get martial artists attacking people. You get You'll hear about a martial arts weapon or such like being used in a fight, but you usually find that the person doesn't use a martial arts weapon. It, the guy who's using the, the weapon or the woman isn't a martial artist. Um, I think there should be stricter controls that weapons are only sold to martial arts clubs. But apart from that, I don't think that it's dangerous. It takes the aggressive young people, burns up their energy through training and sends them out that bit more relaxed and calmer. Right. And on the other side of the coin, you'd have people who'd say that they're peaceful, well-rounded individuals and that they're a credit to the community. Um, what would you think about that? I think the questions would be too general if I was looking at it. I would say that um, you can get good people, you can get bad people. Most of the martial artists I know are they're quite good. They don't actually, I haven't heard of any attacks on people done by martial artists to, to any extent. I have come across a number of aggressive individuals in the club and um, we usually get rid of them through tr hard training. They, 
before we tell them to leave if it comes to it. So I wouldn't actually say no, I, I couldn't actually say that, that you've got good you've got good and bad in, in everyone like it just we don't get that many assholes. Right. And can you tell me as a matter of interest, if you found out that one of your students was using the art you were teaching them to go and bully other people or they were causing fights after a nightclub on a Friday night. What would you do in that situation? Would the student be left train or would he be asked to leave? He'd be told to leave, or she would be told to leave, not to just generalise against males. Okay. Um, have you ever given, yourself or your class, ever given classes to... I think I've got I'm just going to turn the tape over. Two, the time is twenty past three. It's Brian Maloney's folklore project on martial arts. Just to go back to that question again, Brian. Uh, have you or any of your class ever given instruction to children's schools, the ISPCC, youth clubs, for swims groups, anything like that? Well, I've been teaching self-defense for a long time. We've given classes to the Macarena firm. I think we one of the first crowds we taught when I was with. Uh, Page of Venice years ago, a ladies group in Brahim, that's where it was one of the first ones I taught. Apart from that I've taught uh, VEC groups, like um, there was a musical band up in South Hill, I taught a course in self-defence there, and there was a school in Tormengate, children's, and there was a summer school kind of, summer camp you know for the kids. I've taught self-defence classes there for two years running and the ISPCC in Cork asked me to give a course for them down um, in Kerry one time, I gave the course there. There'd be a, I could keep going on naming different groups. We we do run courses, we've also done St. Kim in school in uh, Shannon. <coughs> okay. um, why do you train? What's the reason behind you? you're actually training and learning all of this and what gave you the greatest enjoyment in your time in training? That's two or three questions there. Um, why do I train? Well I enjoy it, it's kind of like a drug for me at this stage. It's a big part of my life. It, it's a good way of burning up aggression, like I said, or just forgetting about what's actually gone on in the daytime. I go out there, I do my bit of training, I, I practice, I have a good laugh with the lads. And uh, you're improving, or you're keeping your same level, depending. Like sometimes you have to slack off, like I'm doing classes at the moment, so I have to slack off some of the training. But uh, it's just really because I enjoy it. What was the second part of that question? The second one was what gave you the greatest enjoyment in your time in training or in the club? Well, I think that's teaching others. Like you watch someone come in who isn't that good at uh, mechanical movement and over a period of time their mechanics build up until they're moving nice and fluidly and they get so much more confident. I, mean, I can remember a guy called Finbar when he came in and Finbar was about 60 years of age and he was doing training and he felt very rigid and comfortable so he told him to think of dancing because he was very good on the floor. <laughs> he used to do Latin dancing and he started moving much more comfortably and got much better at the technique. He went up through one or two belts, I think it was a red belt when he left. Um, we've also taught people with cerebral palsy. Okay. Um, now you spoke about your style being practical and you said that the weapons can be used for practical reasons. Have you ever actually had to use it on the streets? Not so much to punch someone because uh, I haven't had to punch anyone I don't think in years. Um, I can remember being out with a girlfriend once and her being grabbed by the ass by one guy and catching him up by the uh, armpits which is very very uncomfortable, it stops the hands from coming in and we're catching up and driving up against the wall um, as a self defence technique I didn't actually hit him, didn't have to, he was too scared afterwards um, so he just went off on his way and he wasn't molesting any women after that and that night. Okay. 
Um, on another occasion, I came out of the Broad Street gym and I was going up High Street in Limerick, which uh, there was two girls with me at the time from the club, both of them doing weapons. One was Mary Logan and there was another one, Valerie Bug Bugler. And at the top of the street, I could s I spotted two guys up from MacArthur's, which is a games plus video arcade. I spotted two guys up there, uh, three guys, and they were about to do a mugging, and I believed that we were the people who were going to be m mugged as far as I was concerned. So um, two of them came out in front of us, and one came around to grab one of the girls. He was going to grab Mary, actually. He would have been a silly man. <laughs> um, but on the night, we were all armed to the teeth with weapons, and I just reached into one of the cases. I didn't actually have anything in the case, and I just smiled. I was carrying out a rucksack in my bag, and I had a bag here, and I had another bag with four-foot staff and a sword in it, a wooden sword. Um, you're allowed legally to carry weapons to and from training by Irish law and British law as well. But I just reached into the case, and I smiled, gave your man a wink in the front, and the two lads pulled back. <laughs> they didn't trust me. Um, the third guy just walked away afterwards. He was cursing and swearing, asking what the two were doing, why they didn't continue with the mugging. Um, similarly, on another night, we came up through High Street. Again, myself and uh, Mary walking up the road. And two, three lads came around the corner, all about 19, 20. Um, and they stood at the side of the wall, just getting ready for to come at us. And we just turned towards them. And night lads, and they knew that we were meant business. If they wanted trouble, they were going to get it. And they just backed off. And we carried on our way. So you've never actually been engaged in a street fight? I have been engaged in street fights, all right, but I haven't had to use. Uh, that was prior to me taking up the club, not uh, okay. during it. Um, some people are fanatical about the training you'd see in movies. People get up at all hours or train to all hours of the night doing this mad training. Uh, would you say that you're fanatical like that? I'd say I used to be. I wouldn't say I do it so much. I wouldn't say I'm fanatical anymore. I spend more of my time teaching these days than actually training, which means it, it's a lot more of a relaxed pace. Um, at the moment, like I said, on a Monday, I'm teaching inside in UCC outdoors for two hours. On Thursday, I'm doing an hour inside in the hall. On um, Friday, I'm doing two hours, and then on Sunday, down in Limerick, I drive down on a Saturday night. Um, on Sunday, I'll be doing. Let me see. Sunday, I could do three hours. I sometimes train in Pat's Place and outdoors. And every second week, actually, in Pat's Place for two hours on a Saturday as well. I teach Pat privately out there. Right. And um, you seem to travel around quite quite a bit as well as going over and back to England. Um, so you seem to have quite and involvement with it. Does that make your partner a martial arts widow? Uh, my partner is actually a martial artist, so that's Mary Logan, the other instructor down here. So she's not, she's mostly with me when I'm going and doing these things, so she doesn't feel left out. That's kind of one of the good things about having a partner that's in martial arts, you don't get that problem. Mm. And do other people, do you think, suffer from that? Are there other people in the club whose partners would be put out because they're spending so much time training instead of being at home with them? Oh, definitely. Right. Definitely. Uh, do you feel newspapers and movies and videos give an accurate picture or is it completely fantasised about martial arts? Um, I would say that uh, movies are inaccurate because you get one guy fights off a hundred, you know, in the movie. Um, I mean, Rambo, I think, killed about 300 <laughs> in one movie alone. Like, um, it's, it's fantasy, it's good fun, it's just entertainment to an extent. Um, reality, you're not going to get that. You're going to get a simple move, a guy's going to attack you, you're going to kick his knee, disable him, or hit him to the side of the neck, knock him unconscious side, not the back, because if you hit the back or the front, you could kill someone quite easily. And it's still dangerous to hit someone on the side of the neck, but you see this in movies all the time.
you see guys getting hit in the back of the neck, full force blows and they're waking up. Uh, that doesn't happen. That kind of blow would kill someone in reality. Right. So are there any books and videos that you would recommend that have um, a sound view of what martial arts are and why would you recommend them? Well, out of a number of videos, um, Mike Finn has a series of videos at the moment. This one is called uh, Setai Jodo, which is the Shindo Masuryo Jo system. And that's the, the kind of video, that's the, the video of it. It's got the basic techniques of it and how to do it, both sides. Um, this is just one this is of his Kobodo videos. He's got four of those, which is Ryukyu Kobodo, a traditional nunchaku as taught by Seiko Suzuki Sensei who taught Mike Finn. It's Mike Finn in the video. He gives a history and uh, what the techniques are. There's another one on Japanese masters, which he videotaped in London. You've also got the, uh, this is one I liked anyway. This is Seven Samurai by Kurosawa, famous Japanese film with subtitles. The Tashiro Mifune is the hero. And uh, you've got Yojimbo, another character. Brilliant. And you've got Senjura. This is the Japanese side. You have uh, we've got a brilliant martial artist in movies at the moment called Wesley Snipes. He's very fast with his feet and his hands. And he does very good action movies. Uh, very entertaining. Um, as for books, I mean, you can go on about martial arts movies and pictures. It'd just be too many. I have a number of books here. I won't do all of them, but I'll take out some of them. This is the, the Code of the Samurai, which is by Sadler, which is printed by Turtle Books. This is a Ching Yi, Hai Sing Ai is what we pronounce it, but the Chinese pronounce it Ching Yi, a Chinese internal one by William Smith. This is a very good book, excellent. It's a martial arts for beginners, from the For Beginners series of books. It's got a whole lot of pictures and cartoons in the, the book, so it gives you a very good background, martial arts for beginners. This is a very good art author, uh, Mark Bishop. Uh, Mark Bishop teaches Okinawan Karate, excellent book. Gives a whole history of Karate from Okinawa. This is Zen Kobura, his follow-up book, A uh, History of Weapons. This is one of the Zen books, a very humorous one, Zen without Zen Masters. And this is the Comprehens Comprehensive Asian Fighting Arts, Arts by Drager. Deadly Karate Blows, The Medical Implications by Brian Adams. The Bible of Karate Bubishi by Patrick McCarthy. And the top of that. You have uh, one of Mike Finn's books, the illustrated, complete illustrated history of martial arts. Iaido, Japanese swordsmanship by Mike Finn. Jodo. And this is just a few of the books I have. I have about a, about a thousand maybe 500 to about 600 to 1,000 books in martial arts. Um, Richard Kim, excellent stories in karate. Yang Jing Ming, uh, Chinese martial arts weapons. And uh, again, Weapons and Fighting Arts of Indonesia by Dan F. Drager. And excellent book again. Okay. And what about equipment? Um, do you use equipment or is there any specialist equipment you use? Well, in the, the start of this video you'll actually see the equipment. I laid it all out, nunchaku weapons, the weaponry side and the other sides like the kick shields, you know, okay. and the uh, body armor and the gloves. You'll actually see all that in, in the earlier part of the video. Right. And what do you wear? Is there any any specific costumes you wear for training? Well, for 
Karate, you were a white gi, they call it. It's, a, it's just a wrap over, you'll see that in later snippets in the video. For the Kung Fu, there's a black suit, which is there. And for Shindo Masuriyo Joe, there's a Kikogi and the Hakama. The Hakama is a, like a kulats, it's a large pleated pants, a very large baggy pants. And the kikogi is a jacket which kind of wraps over, one side wraps over and then the other side wraps over and you tie it on the sides. And you'd need a, also an obi which is the belt with that, you tie the whole thing up with. Right. And can you give us an idea of what you would do in an average training session, what you would do in a class? Well you get people in, you, you line them up, everyone bows. Um, you get them to run around to get warm, just to warm up the joints and to increase the blood flow to get the body to warm up so we can stretch it that bit more. And then we do a little bit of stretching, like forward stretch, backward stretch for the legs. Um, to be stretching out the spine, movements, different kind of movements. You'd also get, um, you'd also get push push-ups, as in the press-ups when you go on the ground, sit-ups, squat thrusts. But we have a, a weaponry warm-up at the moment where we use one of those big clubs which you would have seen earlier on the video, where you chase someone around with that uh, and you hit them. They have to run to avoid it and get out of the way. We give the weapons usually to kids, they get a good kick out of it. Um, apart from that we'll do forms, which are the moves I was talking about, knife hand, step forward, punch, step back, high block. And then on top of that you'll do um, set sparring where one person will come at another with punches, like maybe three punches, and you get a person doing three blocks to those punches and then hitting with retaliation. Or you can get the same with kicks, like a kick comes in, the person blocks it off to one side, blocks it off the other, blocks it off, then does a, a kick. Or you can get a combination of both, where a person throws a punch for the first time, there's a knife hand block, throws a kick for the second part, there's an X block, and then followed up with punches. It, do, it can be various in that setup. And that's the empty hand side. On the weaponry side, you come in, you do a series of bows, like the first bow is to the shrine, the second bow is to the teacher, third bow to the other students that you're not going to waste each other's time. Um, then you take up the nunchaku, you do a basic set of exercises, like a forward figure of eight with the nunchaku. Um, or a reverse figure of eight, going across the floor as you step. Um, then a forward figure of eight, bringing it over your back, and taking it out and doing a reverse figure of eight with the other hand as you catch it on the other side as you bring it over. Um, you've also got bow. When you move on to that stage, when you move on to the next weapon, you do the bow going across the floor, and then you'll move on to using Sai. All these weapons have been shown prior on the video, going across the floor. So you've got all those, and then you might use the three section staff or something else like that. They'll all be on the, the video again for later. Right, you mentioned bowing to a shrine. Do you actually have a shrine set up in the gym? We have one in Pat's Place. Um, the hall in Broad Street used to have its own shrine, which the Phoenix at the very start of the video was part of. There's a dragon for the other side. Um, the, use, the reason we used Phoenix was the club has broke, gone down so many times and been destroyed, but it's always kept alive by one or two and it comes back up and grows again. Um, but we used to have a shrine there. The shrine is not a religious thing, it's a, a symbol of the past teachers who orally kept the knowledge and using literature as well, wrote it down and passed it on to us. These days you've got videos in the same sense that you can actually see an old master on the video. So it's just right. a symbol of that. Okay, we spoke about grades earlier. Um, how would somebody get a grade? Is it depending on the amount of time they're there, or the amount of inf um, the amount of information and techniques that they know? Well, the uh, the idea is that you come in, let's say, as a beginner. A person comes in, they learn. Depending on which style you're doing, they learn the the warm up exercises. They learn punching and kicking through a set routines. If it was empty hand or they'd learn a set routine with the weapons, like one person striking, the other person defending, and also the warm-up method of using those weapons. 
and they might learn a form, which is a series of those movements going back and forth across the floor, uh, put together and choreographed, teaching them the correct stances and punching, how to improve the technique. And finally they might be mugged, um, given a mock mugging as a self-defense to see if they've practiced the techniques and if they're good enough to move on to the next stage. If they've achieved all that, then they can move on. And are these grades divided into weights? Are your fights divided into weights, like in boxing where you have featherweight? Well, I allow the, the students to fight with anyone. They can fight the smaller person to fight the bigger person, the bigger person to fight the smaller person, a man can fight a woman, and vice versa. Because out in the street you're not going to be limited. And plus it gets everyone to know each other. And like the bigger people take it handy with the smaller people. Do you have a favourite technique? For defence when you're fighting, or for a competition? Well, when I'm fighting, you just run away. <laughs> you don't get hurt. <laughs> um, for defence, I suppose I use a lot of low kicks if it was on a self-defence situation. Shin kicks to the tie, or stamping the knee, or stamping on the foot is excellent because it doesn't take that much training and you can, you can do it at any time. It's, it slows down your attack on no end. Um, punching, well, I'm very fond of using my hands when I do anything, so putting people into locks and holds, I'm fairly good at, or throwing them. So that would be, I've got one called uh, a Luuchi technique, which actually just blocks the movement of a punch as it comes straight in, it'll block it, you push it to the side, and you can hit and knock the person, or when they punch, they grab a hold of their hand and drive them down into the ground. It's kind of the other kind of ideas I'd be using. Right, and in your training sessions, you were saying you had people fighting each other. Is it semi contact where it's controlled, or is it full contact where people are just allowed to batter each other? Uh, semi contact. I used to do full contact originally um, gum shield, head guard, shin pads if you needed them, and foot pads. But people have got to go to work the next day and they can't afford the damage. It's like um, Originally we would have done a lot of punching on uh, solid pads in the wall, but unless you, you build that up slowly, you could do damage to your wrist and your joints. So we don't actually do full contact anymore, semi-contact. By semi-contact, I mean you get hit. You do get hit like, and it, it does hurt to an extent, but not a full power blow. Uh, the girls wear armor, there's head guards, uh, there's gloves, and people should be wearing gum shields. Is there any part of the body that uh, people are not allowed to hit that are off limits? Well, obvious ones, you're not allowed to drive your fingers into a person's eyes. Uh, it wouldn't take a few pounds pressure to damage the eye. Uh, you're not allowed to punch directly into the throat. Um, not allowed to heal a pan directly into the nose or smash the teeth in that sense. Um, you're not allowed in sparring to actually give a chop into the side of the neck which can cut the blood supply off and knock a person out. The reason you're allowed, allowed to punch the front is because the throat is uh, like plastic tubing. Once it goes in, it stays in, it, it buckles, and you block the, the airway. You're not allowed to kick the groin area in a man or a woman, even though accidents do happen. Uh, you're not allowed straight kicks to the knee, stamping down for competition. For training, you're allowed shin kicks to the thigh, um, sweeps to the back of the leg. You load front kicks above the waist, side kicks above the waist. Um, uh, the head is a target. The um, only place a guy wouldn't be allowed to actually hit a woman between this area, obviously. And uh, if a guy does hit a woman in this area and she's not wearing armor, she's allowed to kick him. In the chest, you mean? In the chest area, yeah. Okay. She, she's allowed to kick him where he wouldn't like to be kicked. Okay, if an absolute beginner comes into the club, are they allowed to fight straight away or do they have to wait for a period of time before they can fight somebody else? Usually two or three weeks because it's just to watch what they're like and um, so they can see how it's done safely, so they can do it safely. And in your, we your weapon system you were saying that um, you can get hurt in some parts of it. So does that mean that sparring Free sparring is absolutely not allowed, or is there? A, is it allowed to a certain extent? Well, between the 
the people who've been at it maybe two years, they can do some free sparring, it's late semi-contact, but they've learned at that stage how to stop a weapon dead in its tracks. And they would only be basically, the target area would be between, from the shoulders down to the feet. Um, and that's basically it, like they actually, they can spar with or without gloves, the protective gloves I was talking about. They can spar with or without the armor if they've been at it for about two years. We do that in battle reenactment anyway. Okay. How did you get interested in martial arts in the very beginning? I mean, why did you join? What what made you join? I think my brother brought me back a book by uh, Bruce Tegner on um, Kung Fu and the uh, TV series at the time was Kung Fu the series with uh, David Carradine. And I thought, uh, at the time when you were a kid, I thought it was brilliant. It was the first piece of Chinese martial arts that hit our screen. Um, Bruce Lee had come out at roughly the same time, but I was only about 12, so I couldn't actually go and watch his movies. They were over 18, they were deemed too violent. But that's how basically I got interested in martial arts. I was one of the smaller people in my neighborhood, and it was a rough neighborhood. You were saying you spent an awful lot of time on your training. And you obviously have a collection of books and videos and weapons. So is it a very important part of your life? I would say so. I don't think um, anyone looking at the amount of stuff I've thrown out today as uh, descriptive purposes would say otherwise. And the people you train with, um, would you consider them as your friends? Do you socialise with them? Or would you go for drinks or call to their houses or go out with them? When I was living in Limerick, we used to have parties roughly. I'd say we'd have parties every two months. It was someone's birthday. And we'd also have parties after the gratings. So we got to uh, see and hang around with each other an awful lot. Um, I mean, we'd be telling stories and jokes and just going over incidents that would actually happen in the club that day or that week. They would all be there. So I would say that they're my friends. I, I hang around with a lot of the people still. I'll drop up to Peter's house for a chat every once in a while. Um, I hang around with Mary. There's people like who've been in the club for a while. Is this Pat Fitzgerald? I go to his place training, and we go out there during the summer. A number of us will kick off after training and do some battle reenactment training outdoors out there with nine foot poles. Um, you got other characters which would be attached to the club like uh, Ian. Murphy and Will Hanley. Uh, like these are people I've known for over three years here. You've got um, Tony Kenny and his sister Gillian. They they are actually involved in the club as well. They yeah I would consider them my friends. The same down in Cork in UCC. I'll go and I'll have a lunch with the lads from the club. Maybe two or twice or three times during the week. We'd be chatting or we'd go out, go to lectures in the the college together, nighttime lectures. You've mentioned battle reenactment a few times. What is that? It's where you dress up in period costume and you go out and you uh, fight. Basically, a, a set routine. One of you goes out and you demonstrate how the weapons of that time period would have been used in a safe fashion for people to see. Um, but you can get groups of maybe 20 or 30 on the field facing each other. And they'll do, they'll go out first of all, do a lot of name calling for the show, and uh, then go out and basically do a set routine where each attacker and defender knows what's coming up next. And they make it look good. It's just like movie theatre to an extent, movie art theatre. So it'll be that way. Okay, Brian, that's about all the questions I have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Time is 10 to 4. I'm shutting the tape off now.
forward there, Mike, okay? Okay, so. Thanks, you be on. Take your time, though. Take your time, okay? Nice to be nice. We are now presently recording a battle between two knights, one Irish, one German, both Celts. On the left we have Hasso. <laughs> On the right you have me, Brian. You have to die. Step back
sounding like... We're going to take All a right. 10 minute break before we come back out again. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Thanks, Ron. How do you do this? I mean, that's it, that's your run tape. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Hello, this is for all those nice German people in Germany. <laughs> and for all those nice UCC students that we're going to know and beat up. This is what we do as a nice warm-up yes. for a peaceful martial arts class. All you people down in Limerick who think this is safe, realise how dangerous it is when you see it on TV. No, no, please don't. I'm <laughs> killing you. President of the Folklore Society of UCC, Mr. Brian Malone. Hi, Chief Bottle Washer, that's me. Now, at the moment, we're going to demonstrate how to get hurt using a single stick. <laughs> Hassel is going to be demonstrating German fencing techniques. Perhaps. And I'm going to go for brute force. I like that one.
Just as long as we live, we're okay. <laughs> and it's a Friday afternoon, it's three o'clock. I'm videotaping the Wu Chi Club or some of the members from the Wu Chi Club to give an idea of what they do as martial artists.
the shield? Oh, wake up!